The opioid crisis has it's hit this country hard, and particularly New England. The leading cause of accidental deaths in, in the country it has always been car accidents. Now there's three times as many overdose deaths as there are car accidents. Nobody goes into neonatal medicine because they're excited about addiction. That would be a really odd choice. We don't see that. It's not a, it's not a thing. So, so we don't really have a great understanding of it. If you're in a NICU, the kids are innocent. You know, when you get to adult medicine, people do things, you know, they smoke and do things to themselves. But this is a case where the staff can say, this wouldn't have happened if this parent hadn't done this. And when your job is to protect kids, I think it makes people angry. There's all these studies trying to figure out what the right medication to give these kids is, and the outcome is usually how long they stay in the hospital. The range for the kids who were, who were really exposed to methadone could range from like 10 days to 80 days. That's just unheard of. You don't see anything like that in any other disease process. The moms would feel really guilty. They know that what they were taking, even if it was prescribed, was causing their baby to go through this experience. The moms didn't really want to visit because they knew if that nurse was there, they were gonna, it was gonna be a miserable experience. And then they didn't really trust the staff because they had this sort of feeling that they were being judged. The nurses were angry. They felt like they, they, they were judging the parents. They said, how could they make these choices? Which kind of goes to the misunderstanding of addiction. It's not like anybody really chose to become addicted. When we first started taking care of them, it was hard. They were in double rooms, you know, and so the other parents were in there. You couldn't leave them crying. They didn't want to be put down. You know, there was too much noise. You know, we were always holding babies and they were, you were just passing them off because you couldn't put them down. But they were often more time consuming than some of our other kids. It's hard to not judge and it's hard not to be frustrated so that when the parents actually were there, it, you know, there was definitely that animosity. They were taking care of kids who are 24 weeks gestation, who are micro preemies who are on, have tubes and doing all these life-saving things, but they would list these full-term, otherwise healthy babies as our most difficult babies. So that tells you something. Some babies, it, you could look at them and they look like a completely normal baby. It's the tremors, it's the, that they're not sleeping. It's that they have that. They cry, but not only do they cry, but it's a super high-pitched cry. They're hard to console. You know, you could wrap them, you could hold them, you could put them in a swing. You walk the hallways with them for half hour and it doesn't matter. We were treating these kids not like you would treat a baby. We were separating them from their mom. So if we were a baby and they were crying, we wouldn't decide what dose of medication. We would pick them up and treat them like a baby. It's you know, mind-blowing, right? <laughs> it's completely common sense, but not how these kids were managed. If the parents had been there, it would have been much better. Like, I can snuggle, but I'm not mom. You know, but we were doing all the things that mom and dad should have been doing, like changing and feeding and snuggling and, you know, all the things we know now that work. Babies need to be loved, they need their family. And so the idea of separating them from that to try to make them better defies common sense. You know, so the team always kind of felt incomplete because you were missing mom and dad. And so it's really a question of, of empathy. It's easy to judge, but now we're in a world where most people know somebody who's gone through this. It's really going back to the roots of our profession, which is empathy. And everybody sort of lists as their first line approach to treating these kids is to do non-pharmacologic care, which means you hold them, you swaddle them, you feed them when they're hungry, and you try to keep the environment uh, kind of calm and dark because the kids are sort of hyper-stimulated when they're going through withdrawal. We reduce our length of stay right away. Once the kids start to get irritable and start to cry, the signs of withdrawal will sort of snowball. If you're a nurse and you have five patients and you're responsible for getting to that kid, you gotta give those two kids medications before you can get to the crying baby. It's gone for 20 minutes and the kid's sort of a mess. If you're a parent, you can get there in two or three seconds. And so we started to see how powerful that was. And if it were a medication, then this would be like a major breakthrough and it was actually just the parents. If you're feeling guilty and then we're judging you and telling you that it's your fault, that's probably not helping anything. But if we're saying, okay, yes, but you're the one who's gonna fix it, that's really empowering. We've seen a, such a change in the parents, and instead of feeling like they're not welcome, that now, not only are they welcome, but they are, they are the heroes of the story now. We respect the parents, and they love the babies. And that's it, and that's the treatment. And our length of stay uh, for the last two years is under six days, and the national average is about 21 days. The moms were the treatment for the babies, but the babies were also the treatment for the moms. And what comes out of it is like there's a dramatic benefit to everybody, and, and particularly the staff. So now suddenly, it went from being the hardest kids to take care of to the easiest, because the moms are doing everything, and our job is just to support them and see how do we help them, because we just want to give the mom and the baby the best chance. So it is our only care, is, our, is the compassion and using the family. It's entirely family-centered care, not as a way to deliver care, it is the care.
the results are uh, as dramatic as you can find. There were 64,000 people who died of opioid-related overdoses between January 2016 and January 2017. And there have been more people in one year who died of opioids than died in the entire Vietnam War. It's really striking, and it's just devastating. It's devastating for everybody, for the patients, of course, who are suffering with this affliction, for the families, and for the healthcare providers who are trying to take care of these you know, really sick and suffering individuals. People who are in older age groups, 45 plus, and women are being particularly affected. Uh, so this is something that's just cutting across socioeconomic strata, and gender and cities, urban, rural, it's really, really devastating. So we did a Schwartz Rounds on the opioid crisis, what happens to compassion in an opioid epidemic. The so Schwartz Rounds are the one place where people can really share some of their distress about the things that we see day in, day out. It's very, very difficult to overcome these negative feelings towards patients who don't seem to be able to help themselves when we're trying so hard to help them heal. In our report, in fact, there was one person who wrote in a comment that this person was that individual who would stand up and say, why are we wasting resources on these folks when they don't seem to want to help themselves? Why are we spending so much of our time and energy on these people? Until a child of one of her best friends died of an opioid overdose. And what she said was, I would have done anything <laughs> to help that child, anything. This is really personal to me. I've had to beg people for a place in the, in the hospital or a rehab bed when there wasn't anything available for somebody I loved. And you see the whole spectrum of, of providers and anything from just sort of lack of caring to the most unbelievable compassion you've ever seen. And I think it's harder in some ways for caregivers who have family members who have been afflicted with this your emotions range from anger, like how can you be doing this to me, how can you be doing this to everybody you love, to terror, when you have no idea where that person is, or how to get in touch with them, or even if they're alive, to love. And, you know, not being able to help. It's not good. Sometimes, if we can't cure, what we offer is ourselves. We offer our compassion, we offer our, our care, our concern. And then at the same time, you want to make sure that you're offering the best possible resources and treatment available. And trying to encourage people to take advantage of them when they're ready. We need far more resources devoted to this disaster. This is a tragedy. And it's happening right here, right here amongst all of us. We, we can't let this continue. It touches everybody, and at this point, it will touch everybody unless we do something to reverse this tidal wave.